Okay. And I managed to work out that from studying these people that they were using lists and contrast device. Famously, they were saying, you know, if I've got this book here, this old dogged book, The Hard Sell, full of really great ideas from the famous academic Max Atkinson, you know, you pay 50 pounds for this book in Hamleys or online, but I don't want 50 pounds here. I'm going to go cheaper, you know, half that, 25. No, I don't want 25 today. I want 20. I want 15. No, I don't want 15. It's yours for a fiver. And they would sell it to a whole bunch of people. So they were using these listing and contrast devices saying it's worth a lot, but basically we're going to sell it cheap. And um, we wondered if we could actually do this research with video. I remember going on York Market with Colin and video cameras back then in the early 80s were huge. And there's no way we could do this covertly. It wasn't like a little iPhone. And we remember asking the pitcher saying, excuse me, mate, we're from York University Sociology Department. Can we put our cameras up? And the guy said, yeah, of course. Yeah, they'd put them right at the front. And we wondered, wow, this is amazing. He actually is going to accept us. And the reason they accepted us was they were using the cameras in the sale. They say, ladies, we're making an advertising sale. The goods are going to be cheap until Christmas. And so they were actually using us in their project and we were using them in our project of studying selling, which I always think is a nice relationship. In fact, we were rather scruffy sociologists. I, I showed up in the market in my Beagle car and I remember the market trader saying, guys, could you look a bit more like a TV company? So we went to the audiovisual unit, we got a clapperboard and we looked much more professional. We did take one. And uh, so um, the, the research that Max done has had a great impact in the sense that it enabled us to write this book and academic articles about selling. And we've applied these ideas to, if you look at infomercials today, in fact, those infomercials were started by those same British pitchers who came over to America and started making infomercials using those same listing techniques. And I've actually found that throughout my career, Max's work has been an inspiration. So um, Brian was kind enough to mention the book. Actually, by the way, it's pronounced Moog. Robert Moog, the Moog electronic is not Moog. Many people in Britain, I thought it was Moog, a made up word for the sound, Moog, but it's actually Moog, there's a, a real Robert Moog. And he's famous for introducing the electronic music synthesizer into retail stores in the 1970s. And there was a salesman who did this, a charismatic salesman who I managed to track down. And again, this salesman was using these same listing and contrast devices that Max had pointed to. And my work, I've um, made most of my reputation studying science. I find studying how scientists present at conferences and the laughter that they elicit from the audience and how that's used rhetorically is another aspect. So Max's work has had a lot of legs on it. It's traveled a long way. It has helped my, make my career here at Cornell University. And for him, I'm eternally grateful. So thank you very much, Max. Thank you very much, Trevor. Thank you very much. Um, I, I don't know whether, um, is Clark Judge here on the call? I can't hear him. I can't hear him. Um, so I can't see him either. So um, we'll move on to uh, Maria Glenn. Um, Maria um, is a student at the University of East Anglia and a researcher for the European Speechwriter Network. And I recently asked her to read our Master's Voices as part of her studies. So um, I've invited her to uh, tell us what she thought. Maria. You need to, um, um. Maria needs to unmute. Yeah, Maria, can we hear? Maria? There we go, sorry. <laughs> Firstly, good morning to everyone, and I'd like to express my thanks for being invited to speak today to honour the work of Dr Max Atkinson. I am aware that compared to this event's other speakers and their wealth of professional experience, the utility of my input as a student is a bit puzzling. Therefore, my contribution will be a more personal account of the impact of Dr Atkinson's work. As I speak to you today, I am finally approaching graduation, which for me has been a little longer than I thought a decade ago when I first applied. And I've certainly taken the scenic route. At one point, I was working in behavior support at a residential facility, and I frequently was using my linguistic skills to resolve conflict, 
to motivate clients and to win over a reluctant audience. And then I did not know that persuasive speaking could be an end unto itself, let alone a professional discipline. Similarly, when I was studying at Goldsmiths College, I was unaware that the characteristics of the charismatic leader owed so much to ancient principles of ethos, logos and pathos. While my time at the University of East Anglia has taught me the theoretical underpinnings of the free exchange of ideas, it wasn't until I began working with Brian Jenner for the European Speechwriters Network that the work of Dr. Atkinson was recommended to me. Initially, as Brian said, I was asked to read our master's voices to gain an understanding of political rhetoric in order to inform the research. However, the experience of reading not only that foundational text, but subsequent works by Dr. Atkinson proved a revelation to me as a student, as a researcher, and as an individual. What was missing from my various university studies was the notion that the art of rhetoric and persuasion is central to a healthy democracy and the free exchange of ideas. This oversight seems even more prescient today amidst the current controversy surrounding freedom of speech on university campuses, in wider society, and in the online public square. Political or persuasive speech in an increasingly technological age raises further questions for future scholarship in this area, a task which would be impossible without the essential contributions shared over 30 years ago in our master's voices. Though at time of writing, I doubt even Max Atkinson could have predicted that a head of state might chiefly communicate with citizens in 280 characters or less. As I have said, the work of Dr. Atkinson has had a profound effect on me, both as a student and as an individual soon to be entering the graduate workforce. Whilst many of the key insights of our master's voices remained relevant to my studies in political communication, their greatest impact has been on my own potential to contribute to the field of rhetoric and igniting my passion to do so. In demonstrating how ancient principles of oratory remain the lifeblood of political communication in 2021, the work of Dr. Matkins, Dr. Max Atkinson was key in fueling my interest in studying and practicing rhetoric as a discipline and as an art, introducing me to a career that I am passionate about pursuing. And as a soon to be liberal arts graduate, actually knowing what I want to do with my degree makes me a bit unique among my cohort. The work of Dr. Atkinson has been hugely inspirational, informative and influential on a personal level. As now, unlike most of my peers, I know which career I want to pursue. This has allowed me to see how I could unite my academic knowledge with my natural affinity for language into a specific skill set and an aspiration to enter the world of speech writing. And it's by embracing opportunities like this that I can learn more from the experts so that when I take my first steps into the world of speech writing, I am excited and equipped to further the work of Dr. Atkinson in promoting oracy and hopefully inspiring the next generation. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Maria. Thank you, thank you. Um, right, I've just noticed that uh, Clark Judge has come into the call. Is Clark there? Yes. Are you there, Clark? Yes. Clark. Um, Clark was a former speechwriter at the uh, Reagan White House, and also um, he is the uh, managing director of White House Writers Group, and he's also been a speaker at some of our conferences. So, Clark, you've, you've come in just at the right minute to uh, give your little piece. Well, it's uh, a pleasure, and hello, Max. It's hello. Uh, been a while, uh, but. Um, uh, let me just tell you how I met Max. He published a, an article, an op-ed article in the, in the Washington Post in 
1984. It's hard to believe it was yeah. that long ago. Uh, but he, uh, it, it was uh, laying out his theories. I was a writer for, at that time, Vice President uh, George H.W. Bush. Uh, later, I was President Reagan's, one of President Reagan's writers. And I looked at this and I, I thought, this is fantastic. This man has done real research. He hasn't just uh, scratched his head and waited for, uh, for uh, the muse to appear. He's actually uh, taken a stopwatch. He's done other, other real research. He's an anthropologist and he's had the wit to think that, well, he didn't have to be in a jungle. He was in a, plenty of a jungle in uh, London politics, looking at London politics as I was in a jungle looking at Washington politics. And uh, so I, uh, one thing led to another and I found that he was uh, on sabbatical. I believe it was in South Carolina. Is that true, Max? Was yeah, that Duke, where you were at? Duke University. Uh, at Duke, North yeah. Carolina. And- The part uh, I wrote was about the, um, the TV debate mm -hmm. between Reagan and Monroe. That's right. Now, right. What I said was, if they want to start, stop the audience applauding, they've either got to make, the, make them wear handcuffs or stop the speakers using the most powerful rhetorical techniques known to man. And, and I, I, I saw this and I thought, yes, this is the man I've been looking for. Um, you know, I'd read Aristotle, I'd read everybody else, and, uh, th but here was the man who, could, who was answering the the unanswerable question, how do you get audiences to applaud? Now, uh, and so we tra I tracked him down and uh, invited him to come to the White House where uh, members of the presidential staff and the vice presidential staff, uh, speech writing staffs sat down and listened to Mac. And, uh, and uh, we got lots more applause in the years after that, thanks to his, uh, his contribution and his guidance. Um, it was, uh, th I can't emphasize too strongly how much of a revelation this was, not just because we all have sense of these things uh, as we do, but because here, as I said, is a man who did real research, who, who, uh, who took it beyond the level of, uh, of uh, well, I think, to uh, here is what people are doing, here is how they are responding, here is, uh, and, and applied it, as Max just said, to uh, a, a um, at that time, a national event, and um, transformed, really, how you think, how people think about speech writing. And before that, again, it was, as it remains, an art, but it also is a science. And Max Atkinson is the very first man who turned it into a true science. And Matt, uh, it's uh, a pleasure seeing you and uh, your, your contributions are brilliant and uh, transform the way this, this field has uh, thought of itself and has, uh, and has operated and with great, uh, I remember your various, uh, um, uh, particularly in your film the, uh, uh, that uh, was done for British television, uh, your, um, uh, your, the um, experiment you did with an untrained sp uh, speaker. Uh, well, I was an untrained writer. And uh, so I'm, I'm in your debt for, uh, I, I wasn't on television uh, with people applauding, but uh, many people I worked for were, and uh, particularly two men in uh, especially to uh, two particular men, the president and vice president, and uh, they, as well as I, are in your debt. Thank you so much, Clark. So, um, did, did the last video I showed, did it go through? Did it play? Oh dear, okay. <laughs> right, okay, well, I'll try another video um, and, and hope that this one works. This is the last video. This is Senator John Barroso. Um, John Barrasso from the great state of Wyoming. Can you hear that? I'm United yep. States Senator John Barrasso from the great state of Wyoming. And I'm here with you today because I just want to express my appreciation, admiration, and respect for Max Atkinson. Many of the country got to know him in 1984 with his remarkable BBC presentation of 
claptrap. He talked in that about the need for visual aids and the value. Well, I can think of no better visual aids than seen and heard, our master's voices, and lend me your ears. Uh, read them, been through them many times, and I will tell you there are lessons there that have helped all of us. Because it's what comes out of our mouth that really makes a difference as we try to inform and influence and sometimes inspire and other times inflame those who are listening. I have a chance frequently to talk to students. And as I do that, I talk about the importance of getting their attention. And how do you do it? <clears throat> well, the sort of things that we've learned from Max, it's the items of three, friends, Romans, countrymen, to me your ears. The remarkable lessons to be learned. Now, what Mac has done is put in What happened? We've lost it, Brian. It's frozen. Yeah. For the list of three, Vini Vidi Vici, it's been out there before. But it's bringing those two Brian, like it's I think Brian's Brian froze, and so uh, he, I think his, his connection's been kicked out. No doubt he will rejoin. He's down yeah. in the corner. Uh, he's down on, at least on my screen, second row, bottom. Oh, that's so he is. <laughs> How exciting! Yeah. We're flying without a pilot. Yeah. Right, did that, 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 that kind of cut out, did it? Can you see me? Yes. Yeah, we did, see you now. And you did. Okay, I, I think, I, I, think I, I can just, um, hang on, oops. oops, oops. Uh, we, we heard sort of most of it. Did, did you hear, um, let's just see where we are. By the way, Senator Barrasso's uh, son worked for our firm, White House Writers Group. And I think he got there because uh, his father so admired, the senator so admired Max's work. Um, right, okay, I'm just gonna try again, see if we can, oh, boy, hang on. Uh, Clark, yes. Clark, did you know that um, Senator Barrasso actually saw JFK's inaugural speech? Did he? He did. No, I did not. His father used to take him to the, every inaugural. Ah. Okay, his I think father we can was a senator too, wasn't he? We can resume now. Hang on. Isn't there a thing down here that you can? No sound, Brian. All right, okay. All right, okay, here we go. Oh, no. Hello, uh, right, is that, is that, uh, I thought I'd lost the call, sorry. Um, okay, let, let, uh, let, let me, tr we'll share it a bit later, but um, let's carry on the conversation. Max, have, have you got anything to say? Um, well, uh, I had a conversation uh, with Don Barrasso and um, I was just amazed at how much of my stuff he drank. And also the fact that his father used to take him to every presidential inaugural, at least since JFK. Okay. All right, so has anybody got any questions?
Well, Max, are you ever coming back? To, uh, I know there, uh, there are no transatlantic flights right now, but are we going to be seeing you back in the United States once the world opens up? Well, I hope so. But I don't, I mean, the trouble is, um, we've already had to cancel two holidays in Europe uh, because of the plague. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, uh, we're in the same boat over here, but uh, if, if you're if you're in this country, uh, you have an invitation to come to Washington, and it won't be quite the White House, but it uh, will be the White House Writers Group, and it well, I'll, be, I'll, I'll bring um, lots of people together. We normally see John Heritage at least once a year, mm -hmm. but we haven't seen him for a couple of years now, and last mm -hmm. time uh, we met up in England, uh, but I haven't been uh, to California for quite a few years. Lucinda, Lucinda, you work for the RSC. What, what, what influence has Max had over your work? Um, I don't work for the RSC. Um, I, uh, I work um, at uh, RADA Business. RADA Business, all right, sorry. RSC RADA. I have a five-year-old off school who's, um, who's learning. Hello. Um, but absolutely, I think I, I'm, I'm a voice teacher. So I started off training actors. And now um, transfer those skills into business, different business settings. So I am sometimes working with politicians when I'm not at home with small children. And um, other times I'm working with rugby players, um, boxing commentators, lots of different individuals working with a voice. And I think what Max's book, particularly uh, Let Me Your Ears, helped me in, um, in helping people working with prepared speeches. So again, really helpful to be able to bridge that gap between the artistry of the work and the science um, and also just permission to, to step away from slides and let the language and the rhetoric work. Um, Max, I wonder if I might ask a question about pause. So much of my work is about the power of pause and breath. Um, can I ask, how, how have you trained that before? Are there any nuggets of wisdom you could share with us? How, how, can, you, how, how can you ask? Pause, pausing. The power of pause and how you use your breath to influence and connect oh, with right. the audience. So beyond well, the language itself, the, the space of silence and breath. Okay. The way to measure the si silence is to talk for yourself, to yourself, only not talk to yourself, if you see what I mean. So the, oh, I can't remember what they, um, there is a way in which you can time every pause, and it's by going in your head, one, two thousand, one, two thousand, one, two thousand is an exact second. So if you just say one, two it to yourself, then you've paused for half a second. If you say uh, one, two thousand, two, two thousand, three, two thousand, four, two thousand. That's four seconds. And that's something I learned um, from uh, one of the founders of Conversation Analysis, the late Gail Jefferson. She used to transcribe um, the tapes of uh, Harvey Sachs. And, and she was an unbelievable at transcribing and, and became, she originally started off, a wonderful upward mobility story. She started off as the secretary to Professor Harvey Sachs. And by the time uh, they'd done lots of work together, uh, Sachs, Shegloff and Jefferson wrote the definitive article about conversation. Uh, it has a terrible title, it's called The Simplest Systematics in the organization of turn-taking for conversation. Uh, but it's not a light read, but she was the one who taught me about how to, how to time pauses without using a stopwatch. I remember in the World in Action program, um, Gus MacDonald, who was uh, the, uh, the direct director, he wanted to film me watching speeches on the television. And, and he said, Here's, a, here's a, 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 um, a, a stopwatch. He said, pretend it's a timer. So I was going, I wasn't timing it at all. Uh, so there's a lot of fake stuff in the TV programs. 
Uh, and I, I was just going to say that the, the reason, because uh, in the in the programme that I made, uh, one of the people that Gus uh, organised, Margaret Thatcher had an awful lot of voice coaching and she lowered the tone of her voice almost to half the level between male and female voices. So Gus thought it would be a good idea to have a voice coach in the film. And the person that he, he recruited was Cicely Berry, who was the head voice coach of the Royal Shakespeare Company, as you probably know her. And it was, um, I, I used to, she used to get me to come and give lectures to uh, members of the Royal Shakespeare Company. Uh, but of course she's now dead. And I, so I haven't had any more invitations. <laughs> Can, can I ask, Max, I, I watched um, the Claptrap documentary again yesterday, uh, just to remind myself of, of um, how fantastic it was. And I wondered, what, what have, have you kept in touch with Anne Brennan? And well, what became of her? Did she go into politics or did she? It was a sad story, in my opinion, because I did keep in touch with her for a while. But do you remember that... Uh, David Owen, having made a big song and dance about when they started the SDP, about one man, one boat, blah, 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 blah. Uh, when, uh, uh, when the Social Democrats started, uh, which became the Liberal Democrats, um, he just ca he carried on running an SDP. And uh, Anne joined, uh, joined the SDP. And of course, it fizzled, fizzled away. So thanks to David Owen, um, I, I completely lost touch with her. I used to send her a Christmas card, but I haven't even done that lately. Okay, so um, if those of you who want to leave or need to leave to go on to something else, um, we, we won't mind if, if, if you do so now. Um, I think what I'll do is, is I'll, I'll, I'll email the videos of um, the two videos that, that, that uh, uh, we missed um, or didn't work quite properly. Um, I, I'll send everybody an email so they can they can log on and watch them on YouTube if they need to. Um, but uh, I'd like to at uh, this moment sort of thank everybody for um, their contributions and for speaking and uh, um, thank Max also for, for, for giving us his time. So uh, a sort of virtual round of applause. Make sure it's more than eight seconds. <laughs> One two thousand, three two thousand, four two thousand. <laughs> So, uh, but we can carry on chatting and um, networking if if uh, if you want to. Um, Brian, can I ask a question of Max? Yes, carry on, Louise. So the Chancellor is about to get on to hit his feet. It's going to be twelve thirty when he's on his feet, and he's no doubt driving there now. Max, what rhetorical devices do you think? Richie Sunak should use to convince us that he's on the right track. What would you be looking out for? I wasn't planning to watch it, to be quite honest. <laughs> <laughs> there used to be a time when I would be standing by um, a video recorder waiting for famous speeches, uh, but I don't, obviously don't bother doing that now. And I think one of the things, um, uh, uh, I mean, people have been very kind about um, how my research um, has made a difference. One of the things um, that made a big difference was, that, I know it sounds ridiculous to say it, but uh, 20, 30 years ago, uh, video recorders had just been become cheap enough uh, for people to buy them for, for themselves. And I managed to persuade the uh, then director of the Oxford Centre for Socio-Legal Studies um, to buy me a, a, a video recorder so that I could do research um, at home and obviously use the video recorder for recording TV programmes. And everybody in those days used to have VHS video recorders. Very few had Betamaxes, but Betamaxes were vastly superior in quality. And so I, I and, and because we, because we, the boring story, but the, the unit that I work in 
worked in in Oxford was um, effectively government funded. Uh, if you government funded, this is budget budget related. Um, you have to spend all your money by the end of the current financial year. And so when it's coming towards uh, uh, um, the end of uh, a beginning of April, if you've got any money left in the kitty, you'd better spend it because you won't get it back next year. Anyway, uh, I, I, I waited my time until I, and I said, how much money have we still got left in the kitty? And I said, uh, he said, so many, so many hundred. I said, uh, how about, uh, could we buy, buy a, a video recorder? He said, I don't see why not. And so we bought a video recorder. And if, without the video recorder, I couldn't have done any of this research at all. And I, I know it sounds pathetic because now people have got, they can make films on their iPhones. Um, but in those days, there was something incredibly, from a research point of view, exciting about what you could do with the then brand new technology, which was video recording. Um, now, as far as uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer today, is he speaking today, this afternoon? No, oh, well, so I suppose I better get off this and go down and watch it. Uh, anyway, um, I, I have seen a bit of this chap and uh, it, I must say, he does seem to be quite good, uh, but I don't suppose, you know, uh, as a speaker, I think he's a, he comes across far better than Boris Johnson, but then that wouldn't be difficult, in my humble opinion. I don't know how many of you actually listened to Radio 4's news this morning, but there was some wonderful um, alliteration and devices being used actually in the news story. Yeah. I don't know if you spotted that he was going to send out full fiscal firepower. Well, <laughs> Um, I think it was actually the IMF uh, Chancellor was saying we are in a war and these kind of uh, uh, I think imagery that they must have taken a lesson from Max because hospitality is in cardiac arrest that's on the BBC website as well and I think the, probably the soundbite for his speech is going to be first the jabs then the jobs yeah. <laughs> And I've just come off a, a workshop I've just delivered to Hackneybury Council speechwriters, and I've sent them all away. Their homework has been to listen to the Chancellor and to come back next week with what they've picked up in terms of devices. So, Max, thank you for your inspiration to me this morning, because I finished at 11, two minutes past 11, and managed to get into this to hear you. And I told them all, please you know, take a look at what Max is doing. So today is one of those auspicious days and it's a great day to be running a workshop on um, speech writing, but thanks, Max. Thank, thank you, Louise. And um, Paul, do you, do you have any memories of Max or Drew? Yeah, Paul. You mean me? <laughs> yes, yes. I do. I'm very glad that you, uh, you asked me because I was wanting to uh, hold up my hand or, or uh, indicate something. I do, uh, and and um, many. Uh, I was a graduate student uh, when Max began his uh, lecturing career, his uh, university career, and he helped me en enormously. So Max, first of all, thank you very much for that. Um, uh, more than thank you, uh, because in a way my my career was was um, very arose very much emerged from our discussions. We were once um, going down to a meeting, a, a sort of, it was a postgraduate conference. And at that stage, both Max and I were working on, on really on courtroom attraction. And it's worth noting in a way that this, this Max's interest in, in persuasive language in, uh, came originally from working on courts. Uh, mm -hmm. Max was working on coroner's courts and I was working on uh, Northern Irish tribunals. Yeah. Uh, and we were we were going we to together. Sorry, I said we we wrote a book together. We did, we did we indeed. The title, the title we, very good. Should we do a plug for it? <laughs> Order in Court, which I yeah. thought was a brilliant, brilliant title. It was. <laughs> well, and we were, and pro probably on the back of that, um, I must say that on one occasion in a conference in Oxford, I remember. Um, someone re referring to that book 
saying what a what a marvelous book it was, and uh, and uh, could I could I point out to them a uh, Max Atkinson, as though I wasn't a, a co-author, but we'll pass <laughs> over that. Um, but we we we're, we're, we're going down on a train together to this, to this meeting, and uh, I was going to to talk about something to do with courtroom language, and uh, and this is a quiz for you all. Why three? Why do we say friends, Romans, and countrymen, or God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, or uh, the past, present, and the future? Why do the world's religions tend to to uh, put in sculptures their deities in threes? Um, does anyone have the answer to that? Um, and of course, you know, uh, uh, Churchill speeches, <coughs> Churchill speeches are, are full of three parts, although they're misremembered sometimes uh, as, as three parts, when in fact he, he uh, being a great rhetorician, uh, uh, he delivered them in four, so it's blood, sweat, toil and tears, though the pop group described themselves as blood, sweat and tears. Yeah. Um, but why three? If I give you three, if I give you a couple of numbers, if I say three and nine, what's the next one in the sequence? Anyone can anyone can answer. This is a quiz. This is a pub quiz. <laughs> Think of it. Twenty-seven. Twenty-seven. How did you get twenty-seven? Multiply three, three times nine. <laughs> Does anyone have a different answer? Uh... Three nine twenty-seven. Is there a eighty-one? No. Eight no, 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 not for, well, anyway. 180. Yes, okay. 81, 81. Anything else? Sorry, what was yours? What was yours? 108, somebody, I think somebody was joking, 180. Oh, yeah, I was being silly, sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> well, you know, the 15 would be one, you could add six. The point is that there, if you give two numbers, uh, there, there's the possibility you can begin to see a pattern but you can't, uh, you, you can't be sure that you've got the right pattern because there are different answers. If on the other hand, I, I gave you, um, you know, three, nine and 81, you'd immediately know what the, what the fourth one in sequence is, 81 squared. That's to say the three is the minimum number that you need to establish a pattern. Okay. And that is, that is why in advertising, in politics, in religion, in everything, in which you're trying to be persuaded to something, uh, you use three. It doesn't become a myth until you have a third item, does it? Sorry? I missed that. It doesn't really become a list until you have a third item. That's right, yeah. It becomes possible. So that, that's one thing I want, if I could just share a, a, a final thing, which is not quite a memory, but it's, I've just written, uh, I'm just about to publish a, a paper in a journal on another rhetorical device, which called Hendiadis. I'm actually Trevor now, if Trevor Pinch is still here, in a in the linguistics department of York, but uh, Hendiadis is a, is a double verb construction. Go and tell them to be quiet, or I'm not gonna sit here and, and listen to that. So double verb constructions, which again, ar 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 my interest arose from hearing them in courtroom interaction. Um, and uh, one of my co-authors, uh, a very eminent, uh, Finnish a grammarian uh, who's now she's now retired but she we had an email correspondence last week and she said this reading through the cases that's to say the cases we have of Hendiadis in different languages so reading through the cases I started to think about the ingenuity of the early Greeks who perhaps sitting on a square began to listen to and observe people talking how they were telling their stories and how they argued or fought in their disputes and then the philosophers began jotting down the observations that seemed to have effect on listeners or on their co-participants and began to call their collection rhetorics. Now this follows really Clark Judge's observation about you, Max, which is that, you know, you, your work is based on research and he, he actually referred to as an anthropologist. That's exactly what this uh, friend Ali Hakalinen is describing. That's what, that's what you have done. That's what science is. It's sitting and observing. That's a hendiadis, of course. Um, uh, but it's observing uh, how people actually behave and, and uh, how their behavior affects other people. And uh, you've done terrific, great work in that field.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. Um, Maria, I think you had a question. Yeah, I just wanted to ask um, a brief question to Dr. Atkinson. So I have um, written speeches for other people to deliver in the past and really enjoyed that process, but I found writing one that I had to deliver was considerably more difficult and this was my maiden voyage. So I hope I wasn't too robotic, but I just wondered what advice you would have for someone in my position, hoping to kind of learn the <laughs> skills of this trade and um, be able to enter um, this career path. Well, it's not, the, the trouble is, um, I, the short answer is, I don't know. Uh, the conceited answer is read some of my books. But I think, interestingly, a lot of people have been referring to our master's voices. Uh, actually, I, I don't think that was as well written as Lend Me Your Ears. Because Lend Me Your Ears, um, I, I had the advice, I was very lucky, I had brilliant advice um, from my literary agent. Um, and he, he actually made it much, much more readable. So, uh, and in Lend Me Your Ears, um, I think uh, you'll find that much more helpful than, uh, uh, sorry, in, I forget the name, yeah. In Lend Me Your Ears, you'll find it a lot more helpful than Our Master's Voices. Because when I wrote Our Master's Voices, I hadn't a clue that anybody was going to read it. I'm not a clue. I mean, it was, I, I suppose, um, when it did lead uh, to this famous TV program, uh, but the thing that I find <laughs> worrying at my age is that I was only 40 when it came out and I think it was probably my midlife crisis. <laughs> you know, I wrote this book uh, and um, anyway, so I had my mid midlife crisis at the age of 40 and I'm not going to tell you how old I am now. Well, I I'm must say like the, the work of yours that I've found most insightful have been your blog posts. Oh, yes. The more recent and, you know, slightly more informal language. I found mm -hmm. those really um, very interesting. Well, Seen and Heard uh, was, in fact, uh, only blog stuff. I mean, that, that book was an accident in some ways. Thank you. OK. Any further questions? I mean, I've just put a question up on the on the chat. Well, just out of interest, I've asked at the outset: Was any of this actually recorded? Will any of it be available? And will there be any links to anything? Um, yeah, I, I can send out um, links to the videos. Unfortunately, um, because of the stress of getting this thing started, I did forgot to press record. So I have I've got I, I pressed record halfway through. So I've got some of it, but not all of it, I'm afraid. But uh, I'll see what what I can find at the end. But but I'll certainly. Um, distribute the, the, the videos Thanks. and um, so you can watch the whole of the senator's speech. All right. So any further, Tom English, what, what's your interest in this subject? Question. Um, basically, it, it would probably be quite overwhelming if I talked about, about it and maybe a little bit self-indulgent, but essentially I I'm on a bit of a public speaking journey and trying to figure out my own my own kind of purpose in life at a broader scale. And I'm in the process of figuring out uh, the problem of purposelessness in particularly in young men and the, the issues that they have at the moment. And you, you might say broadly the decline in society and and how, how I can help other people find their purpose. I kind of went through an existential crisis myself um, when I was at university. I did a TEDx talk on it last year and I'm really interested in building out my work on this and um, doing more speeches, maybe another TEDx, but particularly a book in relation to purposelessness and helping people to find a grounding in, um, in certain principles, I would say, that transcend um, nationalities, races, ethnicities, religions, et cetera, et cetera. 
um, because you know it, it, it sounds it sounds very again it is very existential. So so I look at the works of Nietzsche and the works of the New Testament as well, and um, and also things like the rise of the far right. So you know all all these things are connected. I'm I'm drawing these connections together, and I'm trying to create a narrative, something that can be really useful to people. So it's not just a self indulgent intellectual exercise, but it's something that that actually young men can look at and they can say, okay this is what I, where I can hang my hat. I don't have to be a Trumpist. Um, I don't have to be a leftist. You know, it's not just against the far right. There are, other, there are all sorts of crazy things going on and, and people really don't know how to ground themselves. There's an awful lot of confusion and chaos in the world. Um, I, I'm, not saying, I'm not arrogant enough to say that I've invented any of this stuff. It, it's been around for a long time. The Greeks talked about it. It runs throughout, these principles run throughout the Bible as well. Um, but I just need to be a lot better at communicating that to other people to make it accessible. So, so that's really that's really my interest. Forgive me for, for rambling on, and hopefully it wasn't too, um, hopefully it wasn't too self-indulgent. But, but that's that's where I'm coming from. Okay, thank you, Tom. Um, Max, do you want to tell us your communist manifesto anecdote? <laughs> um, oh yes, uh, if I can remember. <clears throat> it's relevant, I think, to this, this thing. Um... Well, people uh, always think the Communist Manifesto was only written by Karl Marx, and it was actually co-authored by Marx and Engels. And there was some, I can't remember where I found it out, but um, Engels, of course, was uh, a rich Manchester businessman's son. Um, and... Um, uh, I went through the Communist Manifesto and I was amazed at how many contrasts and three-part lists there were in it. And from, I mean, Paul will appreciate this, uh, I, I was quite thrilled by this because the kind of sociology that Paul and I got involved in, conversation analysis, was loathed, absolutely hated by mainstream sociologists because mainstream sociologists had been taken over by Marxists in Britain. I don't know about whether it's still the same or not. Um, and I thought, this is amazing. You know, Marx or other Engels was surprised. They were surprised at the power of their own rhetoric. And I, that, so, so if you go through it, you'll find that it's unbelievable how many of the sentences and all the rest of it are either contrast, three-part lists, and so on and so forth. And, and so it, it, it's, if you wanted a, those who are looking for how to write better, uh, my I suppose best recommendation is just read, not many people have read it, The Communist Manifesto. I want to balance that with some, <laughs> something. Uh, and of course, don't forget that um, one of Hitler's famous three-part lists was Ein Volk, Ein Reich, Ein Führer. So it works for left, right, extremists and all the rest of it. But, but it also works for tabloid journalism as well, doesn't it? It does, yeah. 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 The editorials of tabloid journalists okay. uh, are written in well, the same one of the, Again, one of the people that... Um, that Gus MacDonald involved when we made the World in Action programme was Joe Haynes, who was uh, originally, he worked for Daily Mirror, he was a Daily Mirror leader writer, and he was also Harold, Harold Wilson's head speechwriter. You know, because people, when they look back about former British Prime Ministers, they tend not to think about Harold Wilson. But there were things that Harold Wilson did, which we should all be very, we Brits should be very, very thankful for. One of the things that Wilson did was to refuse to allow any British involvement in Vietnam. And so, you know, we don't have uh, Vietnamese memorials. Whereas obviously, if you go to Washington, you can see it. I mean, it's it's absolutely appalling. So, but Wilson, very underestimated, estimated, um, just wouldn't have anything to do with it. I can't remember who the presidents were at that time, but whoever it was, 
uh, Harold Wilson, uh, who of course was a Yorkshireman, um, said no, it's not having to do with that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Paul, would you like to say something? Yeah. <laughs> Could I just uh, um, say about the, the, the three-part list, which I, 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 I share Max's enthusiasm for. Yeah. By the way, an another anecdote about uh, the, the Communist Manifesto is that, that Marx wrote his part of it, at any rate, uh, I don't know what, what role Engels played, played in it, but he wrote his part um, in, um, in a house on the, on the corner of, of a square in Brussels, very, very famous tourist square, um, which is now a restaurant called the, the, I think something like the Golden, the Golden Lion or the Golden something rather, a, a swanky hotel, a, a swanky restaurant. Uh, but at that time it was a very swanky, ultra bourgeois yeah. uh, house. He hung out, you know, of course, <laughs> with the very wealthy <laughs> because they were the people who, yeah. who supported his work. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, I, 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 I do share this kind of three part, part uh, uh, the, the fascination with uh, three part constructions. Um, and in, in the work that we all, well, we all, some of us do in, um, in various uh, areas, I, I work a lot on medical interaction um, one, but but wherever, what, whatever kind of interaction, one finds three parts very commonly. And I have a lecture which is called Politics, Advertising, and Other Fairy Stories. <laughs> and of course, fairy stories are absolutely uh, litter. There are very few which are not three-part lists, even those which are two and one. So Cinderella has two ugly sisters and she's the third. So you get the contrast between the, the two. And so actually some, some of them combine Max's observations about contrasts and three-part lists in a single rhetorical structure. And Cinderella is the best example of that. But there are other fairy stories. I mean, the, the littered, littered with uh, the, the three brothers is, is a contrast between two, two stupid brothers and the other bright one. And the other bright one uh, follows the uh, the Freudian uh, ego, superego, and id. He follows his id down into the subterranean world. So anyway, Freud Freud understood as well. The, so my my tip, it's not quite a tip, uh, Maria, for um, you know how to get ahead, uh, but 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 it is true of sociologists, philosophers psychologists etc that if you to get ahead you have to invent something and all you need to do is to invent something with three parts three uh, threes uh, by the way it was well known this this is true in science uh, it, you know there used to be thought there were two two forms of carbon which is basically graphite and, and diamond that sort of uh, and then it wasn't and unfortunately I can't remember the name of it but the but a group at Sussex in the early 80s discovered finally what was suspected to be the third, the third form of of, of carbon. So nature also uh, abhors less than a three, as it were. That's it. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. I think um, it's probably a good time to wind up now. So I'd like to thank everybody for participating. Um, thank you, Max. Uh, it's been fun and really interesting to hear so many accounts of your work over the years. Uh, We've got lots of more events. We're going to doing um, how to write speeches like Shakespeare on Friday at three o'clock. And, on fr and uh, also I've got a, a, an interview with uh, John Paul Flintoff, who's written a rather good book um, on public speaking in April. So um, this has been a sort of European Speechwriter Network event. And um, I hope you'll come back and join more of our Zoom conversations. Um, and thank you to the speakers, to David and, 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 and all, uh, and all the lords and, and distinguished people. So um, until the next time, thank you very much, everybody. Thank Goodbye. You. Thank you, Brian, and thank okay. you, Max. Thanks, Clark. <laughs>